Good afternoon and a warm welcome to today's webinar, How to Do an Endometrial Biopsy. I'm Emily Austin, Managing Director of Cooper Surgical Fertility Solutions in the UK and Ireland. If you have questions at any point during the webinar, please enter them into the chat box. We'd love to get your questions, so please ask away. We will answer these questions after the presentation. Joining us today, we're delighted to have our colleague David Crimes, who will be hosting today's Q&A session. David is a PhD molecular geneticist with 16 years experience in reproductive health molecular diagnostics. In addition to working at various UK university and research institutes, David has also worked for Blue Gnome and Illumina before joining Cooper Surgical in 2016. As Director of Global Genomics Business Development, David continues to drive future innovation in the genetics of disease within the life science and innovation team here at Cooper Surgical. Also joining us today, we're extremely lucky to have a very special guest. Miss Amanda Toza is a consultant gynaecologist and subspecialist in reproductive medicine, lead clinician and person responsible to the HFEA at Aria Fertility in central London. Amanda has spent more than 20 years assisting couples experiencing infertility, recurrent miscarriage and having trouble conceiving. Amanda is incredibly knowledgeable in all aspects of fertility and provides a wide range of services for assisted conception and fertility preservation, including egg freezing, IVF and genetic testing. Amanda is also an expert in general gynaecology and women's health. Amanda also undertakes minimally invasive gynaecological surgery for endometriosis, uterine fibroids, ovarian cysts and uterine anomalies such as adhesions, polyps and fibroids. Amanda graduated from the University of Wales College of Medicine in 1990 and followed this with extensive specialist studies in obstetrics and gynaecology. She has held a number of positions in the NHS and private sector and contributes greatly to scientific medical research. Amanda will be describing and discussing today how to do an endometrial biopsy. Great to have you with us Amanda. Also joining us today, we have Christine McWilliams. Christine serves as the Medical Director of Genomics for Cooper Surgical Fertility. She's instrumental in defining the path of the Genomics Division and works closely with cross-functional teams. Christine also manages the Genetic Counselling Programme and guides the team's clinical decision-making, ensuring clinicians and patients are equipped with genomic information to inform their transfer decisions. Dr. McWilliams has been in the field of PGT since 2013 and has a particular expertise in PGTM. She obtained a medical degree and PhD from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine's Medical Scientist Training Programme. Her doctorate is in the field of human genetics and epigenetics. Christine, great to have you joining us again. I will hand over to you for a short introduction and background into endometrial receptivity testing. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Apologies for uh, my delay in getting myself off mute and, uh, and on video. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to, to join you today um, and to hear this fabulous um, presentation shortly on endometrial biopsy. Um, I, uh, before we get uh, started with that, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk to you about endometrial receptivity testing. Um, which as we know is a uh, up and coming um, and increasingly frequent um, uh, uh, utilization for endometrial biopsy. And I would like to just review with you a few um, clinical considerations associated with this testing. By way of disclosure, I am a paid employee of Cooper Surgical. Uh, so why are more and more physicians considering, considering endometrial testing? Well, as we um, know, um, as we have experienced um, a lot of recent uh, improvements and innovations, both within the IVF laboratory, as well as within the, um, the genetics laboratory. However, um, neither of, uh, we still with these recent improvements, certainly cannot guarantee a pregnancy will occur even after transfer of a uh, high quality euploid blastocyst. And of course, there are many um, areas of uh, future opportunity to Im potentially improve these outcomes, um, which are listed here with one of these being recurrent implantation failure, which is a topic we'll, we'll touch on just a little bit today. 
And towards these efforts, and certainly we understand that the, the endometrium um, is essential for both uh, achieving and sustaining a successful pregnancy. Um, and so it is itself a good target in the pursuit of improved pregnancy rates. And specifically, there have been um, a number of recent efforts to look at uh, the opportunity or potential of identifying a molecular signature that, um, uh, that is associated with an endometrium that appears to be ready um, to uh, receive a, a transferred embryo and lead to highest levels of, uh, of transfer and pregnancy success. Um, and it is that uh, molecular signature and that type of testing to identify that molecular signature in endometrial biopsies that is referred to as endometrial receptivity testing. And um, once identified and uh, with a, uh, a, you know, a test developed to recognize this uh, molecular signature, um, there have been some uh, early initial studies to, to look at its uh, potential to uh, improve um, outcomes, particularly pregnancy outcomes for patients undergoing IVF. And this slide here just demonstrates two of the earliest studies um, to look at the potential of, of this test. The um, study on the right was a study that was uh, conducted in 2014 and looked at a group of patients, the same patient cohort um, that had failed to achieve uh, ongoing pregnancy with a standard uh, endometrial tra or embryo transfer rather. Um, and then uh, looked at these same patients if they uh, had endometrial receptivity testing um, to guide uh, a future embryo transfer um, and found indeed that these patients did uh, achieve higher levels of success um, with that, uh, that targeted and, uh, em embryo transfer. Um, on the, uh, on the right is a second study that looks specifically at repeat um, recurrent implantation failure patients. Um, and in this study, patients were um, uh, separated into, into arms um, that either had received a standard embryo transfer or a uh, personalized embryo transfer guided by endometrial receptivity testing. And again, found that those patients that received the endometrial receptivity uh, testing had improved outcomes in key areas such as implantation rate, ongoing pregnancy rate um, as well. And so these early studies um, began a conversation of looking a little bit more closely at which patients could benefit from endometrial receptivity testing. Um, as we just reviewed, there is some demonstrated um, clinical utility in RIF patients, and we reviewed a couple of the, um, the, the studies that have shown this. And there's also been at least one study that um, has shown some improvement um, with uh, using uh, endometrial receptivity testing and personalized and, uh, embryo transfer in uh, adenomyosis patients as well. Um, the field is now um, looking a little bit more closely in ongoing uh, clinical studies at potentially expanding the application for endometrial receptivity testing. Um, for example, into patients that have only one identified euploid embryo for transfer and even uh, the general IVF population as well. And you know, certainly to further these efforts to find the uh, patient populations uh, most suited to, to benefit uh, from endometrial receptivity testing, of course, high quality uh, tests from uh, genomics laboratories such as our own um, are essential to, to help further those, those efforts and understand the utility of this test. And obviously as, as clinicians, we always strive to provide patients actionable results uh, the, the first time with their, their very first test. But however, this is especially true when a procedure is involved and particularly true when an invasive procedure such as an endometrial biopsy is involved. And in general, uh, with genomic tests, um, a quality genomic test should provide to the ordering clinician and the patient a low uh, rate of no results. Um, 
as well as consistently accurate results and results that are highly reproducible as well. And that really has been the, um, the those, those goals have been a guiding force um, for our laboratory in developing our own um, ER peak endometrial receptivity test. We're, we're happy um, to at this point to be able to offer a test we truly feel um, does provide actionable and accurate, accurate results the first time. Um, as with our uh, PGTA technology, uh, which you may be familiar with, our ER peak uh, testing is also uh, powered by artificial intelligence or AI uh, to provide these outcomes. Um, specifically, we've developed a um, very innovative approach um, using that artificial intelligence uh, technology to correct for sample variability, which can be frequently found uh, between uh, endometrial uh, biopsy samples. And this um, is really what has afforded um, our ability to provide an accuracy rate of 96% with also um, uh, five times lower no results uh, rates compared to the, the ERA test um, that was the first on the market and also um, the, the test that was the basis for those clinical studies that we reviewed earlier. Um, we're, we're happy to, to offer um, with our ER peak reports and test results what we feel are clear reports uh, with a four category result reporting um, with th those categories being either pre-receptive results, receptive, post-receptive, or non-receptive. And if a patient is a uh, patient sample is found to uh, be either pre or post receptive, the, the results, uh, the report will also indicate some recommendations with regards to um, amended time for transfer, for the, the uh, embryo transfer cycle. Um, with regards to endometrial receptivity testing in general, just as a reminder, um, this testing is um, to date performed on a mock cycle um, before the, uh, the planned embryo transfer cycle. Uh, typically, uh, the, the, the biopsies that, that you'll hear more about uh, shortly um, are uh, performed at five days after. Um, initiation of progesterone, which you know seems to be the the, the typical timing um, for a transfer, if it were a standard transfer, um, not guided um, by uh, endometrial receptivity, and we um, we try to, to to certainly match that. So this um, this slide here shows uh, if the the patient's result um, were to be found within the receptive range at that P um, plus five biopsy, then the rec recommendation would be for the embryo transfer cycle to perform that, um, that cycle, uh, that transfer at that same date of P plus five. Um, however, some patients will receive a pre-receptive uh, result. And in this instance, what the ERP uh, test will recommend is that in fact, um, the biopsy then be, or sorry, not the biopsy, but the um, transfer be delayed by 24 hours relative to the timing of the biopsy. Um, so typically at a, at a P plus six date. And conversely, for patients who are receiving post-receptive results, then the ER peak test result will recommend that the embryo transfer be brought forward by 24 hours, again, relative to the date of, of biopsy in the, um, the mock cycle. As far as the, the process for obtaining, ordering and obtaining um, ER peak results, it's four simple steps. Um, the first being the endometrial biopsy and sample shipment um, to a Cooper Genomics laboratory, followed by uh, la analysis within our laboratory, again, powered by artificial intelligence, followed by the result reporting that we just reviewed, and finally, that precision embryo transfer to, to hopefully give this patient the very best um, chance of securing a uh, pregnancy as well as an ongoing pregnancy. And with that, I thank you very, very much 
for uh, your time. And I will sit back and, um, and, and learn uh, more about the endometrial biopsy process itself. Um, thank you again. Oh, great. So, I mean, the, um, beside the patient, uh, what equipment do you need to do an endometrial biopsy? Um, I've got a lot of, of equipment on here uh, and not everybody may use uh, it all, but obviously there's the inevitable uh, gloves, speculum, uh, sterile gel, uh, sponge forceps, swabs, a single tooth tenaculum, saline, gallipot, pipel, pot to put the sample in and a good light source. So, I'm kind of, you know, saying the obvious here, uh, but it's good to have everything ready um, just in case you need it. As I say, you may not need or may not use everything, um, but it's good to have uh, uh, everything ready and prepared. It's also good to familiarize yourself, I think, with the Papel. Um, obviously, if you've never used one before, it's good to have a look, uh, take one out, uh, have, a, have a look at it. And, and it's a suction curette which takes the sample and you're going to kind of create a vacuum uh, in that papel by putting back on the inner stylet. But you can see on this diagram, there's a small hole at the top through which the endometrium will be sucked. And the papel itself is graded um, and it's graded in centimeters so that you know the depth of markings so you know how deep in the cavity uh, you are and the markings are also good because you're going to pull back on that inner stylet uh, to about sort of the seven or eight mark that's recommended to gain a good uh, endometrial sample. Again, you know, uh, uh, most uh, reproductive medicine specialists, of course, have done lots of embryo transfers. Uh, so they, the doing an endometrial papel is a pretty straightforward, uh, easy procedure to do. And you, you can either do this in a, an outpatient uh, office type environment, or of course, if you're in an IVF clinic, you can do this um, in the theater environment as well. Uh, whatever, you need to, of course, place the, uh, place the patient in the lithotomy position, um, insert the speculum, and you need to get a really good view of the cervix to do that before you start the procedure. So really get yourself a good view, good light source um, to do this. Again, you can do this by yourself. You can have an assistant with you. Um, I, I usually very gently clean over the cervix with some saline using the sponge forceps and the gauze. This is not a, this is not a, a really good clean. This is just a wipe over the cervix very gently. Um, I always, in fact, place the tenaculum on the cervix. Again, this is optional and uh, it depends on what you're comfortable with doing. But for me, although it's a little bit uncomfortable for the patient, it does allow me to um, sort of hold on to the uterus. And I find it, I can uh, insert the papel much easier. I know exactly where I am in the cavity um, and uh, it allows me to do the whole procedure uh, more efficiently. But again, some people prefer not, uh, and you can of course perform that biopsy uh, without the need to place the tenaculum on, but I do find it, it aids the process. Um, I then, uh, once I've done that, I'll insert the papel to usually to the depth of the cavity or at least six centimeters on the papel. Again, those people who are reproductive medicine specialists find this should find this really easy. We're used to putting catheters in the uterine cavity. We're used to measuring the depth of that uterine cavity. So I put it in. I pull back on the uh, inner stylet uh, to create that suction. And then what I do is I pull the whole papel backwards towards the cervix. I rotate it 90 degrees. I push it back in. I put it back out again and I repeat that. So I've got a total of, if you like, four times I'm doing that. And it's a very, very quick process. It's speedy in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out. Um, and I have said that I always get a good sample uh, doing it that way. Um, 
I've just put this in uh, because these are sort of some of the issues that I have found doing this. Um, for most cases, particularly for fertility patients, um, it's not difficult to get in. Uh, patients are often having this for uh, recurrent implantation failure and any real difficulty has already been identified uh, when doing embryo transfers to get into the cavity. Um, but there is no memory associated with the papel, um, which means that if you try and bend the end to curve round, um, it will curve a little, uh, but not a great deal. Um, in those cases where I can't get into the cavity, um, I will use a plastic sound. Um, these do have some memory and they are really useful for locating the way in, into the cavity. And of course, you can always uh, measure the depth of the cavity uh, with that. Uh, some people I know may use a sound from the beginning um, just to identify the depth of the uterine cavity. But I don't think that's essential. Um, the most important thing is not to force the propel in. You've got to use a degree of pushing, if you like, uh, but slightly not to force uh, the propel in. Um, and you can do the biopsy in most cases. I've put more than 95% here, but I think for, for mostly for fertility patients, I, I think I've, I've only not been able to get into the cavity uh, on one occasion. And, I, and I've done hundreds and hundreds of these. The, this, it's, a, it's a very low risk procedure uh, for sure. Um, the risk, I suppose, greatest risk is just not getting in. Um, but you don't need prophylactic antibiotics. They're not recommended. They're not recommended by the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists for doing endometrial biopsy. There is an extremely low risk of perforation. This is not a forced procedure. This is a fairly gentle procedure, even though the patient might not feel it's gentle. Um, and you rarely will get any bleeding. The only time I ever get bleeding, of course, is the tenaculum can sometimes cause bleeding at the site I've placed it on the, on the anterior lipid cervix. But the procedure is uncomfortable, um, particularly nulliparous women. Uh, I find that in those women who've had a baby, actually, they tolerate the procedure unbelievably well and, and it's associated with very little discomfort. Uh, but those women who are nulliparous uh, do get period-like cramps during the procedure and after. It's most painful during the um, procedure, uh, but it settles extremely quickly. Um, and I've never not been able to do a biopsy because it's too uncomfortable. And I think speed is of the essence when doing this type of procedure. Uh, and the quicker you can get that biopsy done, uh, the less uncomfortable uh, it is overall for, for the patient. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to David, I believe, now. Yeah, uh, I believe so. Uh, so thank you very much, Amanda. That was a fantastic talk. Uh, very very insightful on, on how to do the biopsy and also reassuring, at least from uh, our side, that in the vast, vast majority of cases that uh, it goes relatively speaking uh, well and you, you can pretty much get a biopsy every time. I mean, I'm sure that is a concern for, for both the patients and the doctors performing it, the uh, chances of having to come back for a second go shall we say sorry i'm not a genetic counselor as you can probably tell or patient facing so um if i could just start with you amanda i mean have you ever had uh, a biopsy that has been even if you've managed to get a biopsy that has been uns unsuccessful for, for a result um have you have you experienced that and, and have you ever had to Rebiopsy a patient, and how, how has that been accepted? So interestingly, I've never had a result come back which has been a no result. Uh, so um, the biopsy, of course, we're doing a biopsy in the luteal phase, and it is rare to not get an adequate sample. That's for sure. And I've never had a result come back say that there, there's no result. So I've been, either I've been very fortunate, but I have done a lot of these. So I think statistically, um, I, I would say I've been very fortunate. I think I, I think you the chance of getting a good sample is close, 
once you've got in and done the box, it, it's, it's close to 100%, uh, and, it, and it is. I've had to rebiopsy patients um, because there's been a request for, for a rebiopsy, uh, and I've rebiopsied pa patients for different reasons. Um, uh, uh, on, on, on different types of things, uh, looking at perhaps the microbiome of the patient's endometrium. And actually patients tolerate it very well because it is so quick. So whilst it is very uncomfortable at the time, it's a very, very quick procedure. Okay. Um, thank you for that. It's good to hear that you've uh, basically got a very, very good result rate and a very, very low no result rate. So. Uh, just as a reminder to, to the audience, please feel free to type some questions in the Q&A uh, if you wish. Uh, but also we have had some come in, uh, and this is a bit of a double barrel one for you, Christine, I'm afraid. But uh, we have had a question as to what counts as a RIF patient, a repeat implantation failure patient. And... Um, I wonder if you could start off by explaining what we mean by a RIF patient. Yeah, that, that, that's an excellent point. Um, in, 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 certainly there's different di um, definitions, but uh, I tend to go with the um, American Society of Reproductive Medicine definition um, and as well as um, the uh, ACOG definition. Really with a, uh, a RIF diagnosis, uh, we're looking at um, lack of um, pregnancy or implantation with three high quality embryos. Um, that, that's the, the most typical definition. Excellent. Thank you. And just uh, as a kind of follow up question from a medical uh, perspective. So you, you have your biopsy sample, you have, uh, you've sent it, we've generated a result. Can you just explain to us again, the uh, windows of implantation, you know, when, when you get a result, which windows do we give and how precise are those windows for, from a patient management perspective? Certainly, yeah. I mean, and so, you know, David, as you know, we tend to, to break um, down the three categories, either receptive, um, pre-receptive or post-receptive into 24-hour periods. Um, and so if, if there is um, uh, the receptive result, then it's, you know, typically we would, the recommendation would be to uh, perform the, the transfer on the same date um, as the, the biopsy was obtained. Um, however, if it's, if it's pre-receptive, then the recommendation is 24 hours uh, later um, and post-receptive, meaning that we've already, at the time that biopsy was taken, the, the, the window had already closed, we had missed that window, then the recommendation is to, to move, um, move the, the transfer up a full day relative to when the, the biopsy was, was taken. Um, as for a non-receptive, um, that is a, certainly trickier because that, that indicates that there is something um, going on, there's a molecular uh, profile signature that certainly seems to be um, beyond a 24 hour difference. Um, you know, this, this is a, a result that is um, significantly deviating from, from that of a, uh, of a receptive profile. And there may need to be some, um, some further investigation done, some further questions asked about uh, the, uh, the timing of the, the, the progesterone testosterone, uh, as well as other considerations that uh, clinic, clinicians might review with the patient. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's pretty clear. So if I come back to you, Amanda. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously you've performed uh, a lot of these biopsies and a, a believer in these biopsies, which is uh, great. So I mean, do you target any particular patient groups yourself? And do you think that it could be uh, more widely utilized uh, with the right, right selection of patients? What are your feelings on, this, on these topics? Yeah, I mean, I tend to go with the uh, same sort of you know, criteria for the recurrent um, implantation failure. So patients who've had good quality embryos and not become pregnant. I also um, tend to do them for those patients who have uh, single euploid embryos. So, you know, I might have somebody who's 42 with amazingly got a nice euploid embryo. And of course, uh, you know, I'm not going to run the risk of, or I don't feel I want to run the risk of putting that embryo back without knowing the implantation window 
uh, is right. So um, I tend to do those patients. Of course, you know, having had that discussion with the patient that they feel that's the right thing, and, and most patients would want to do that testing. Um, you know, these aren't special embryos, but they are perhaps the patient's only chance to do that. I, I have to say that I'm probably having more frequent discussions with patients about doing um, implantation window testing. Um, you know, even after a couple of you of, of night of good embryos going back, particularly if they're young and you think this patient should be pregnant, they really should. You know run all the tests if i'm running tests to look at why not uh, i'd certainly include implantation window testing as part of my a part of my routine testing or certainly what i'm offering to the patient as testing okay yeah that's that makes a lot of sense so christine i'm gonna a, a question has just come come in i was hoping you can have a stab at answering this uh if you have, uh, so as we know, um, embryos don't grow uniformly. Some make blastocysts quicker than others, and some make day five, they look beautiful. You take an embryo biopsy at day five, you think it's suitable for transfer. Others, we have to grow to day six or, or even day seven. Um, when you were talking earlier about taking the biopsy sample at P plus five or, or whatever, which is fairly typical, is P plus five. What if you've got a day six or a day seven embryo versus a day five? Does that have any impact on, on, on transfer timing or is it purely based on the uh, endometrial uh, status at, at the time of the endometrial biopsy? What's your feeling on that? Yeah, that, that's a that's a really interesting question. I'm not quite sure that, to, to be honest, whether I have a, a you know a feeling on it. <laughs> I, you know, I certainly haven't seen the the studies out there dedicated to you know to, to that particular question. I think my my hunch would be that um, this is a process that's driven more by the the, the endometrium and and you know and, and so the impact perhaps would not be there. But of course. You know, we're hearing more and more very interesting um, studies that that look at the um, you know early expression of of genes even within the the blastocyst that could certainly be playing a role here. Um, but I'm I'm not quite sure. I'd love to see the studies though. Sure, uh, I think the uh, yeah, it's so many things come together for a successful. IVF uh, an embryo transfer that it's hard sometimes to isolate single points. So I think we need to all just be aware that it's a, it's a multi-stage process with quite a few variables going into the successful outcome, but uh, certainly something we, we need to keep looking at as a community. So um, uh, Amanda, so yeah. you've spoken that you or you pretty much always get a, uh, a result with, with this test and, and the biopsies mm -hmm. are, are good. Was there much of a, a learning curve that you had to go through for the get that biopsy practice just, just right? Or, or once you've yeah. uh, done a couple, it, it's fairly obvious. I mean, what's the learning curve here? Yeah, I mean, the learning curve is of a really, really steep. Uh, you don't need to do many before you can become quite adept at it. I say most people who are... Uh, reproductive medicine specialists are gynecologists and are and are probably familiar with doing endometrial biopsies for different reasons uh, in any case. Um, I say these are young women. Uh, it's a very different uh, to doing somebody who's postmenopausal a biopsy on, which can be quite difficult. Um, and often I say with these patients that we're doing them on, um, they've had embryo transfers before. Um, so we can we we know if there's going to be some difficulty there any in any case. Um, but yes, it doesn't take long to uh, to become very competent at doing an endometrial PPL. And you know things like tubing the sample, all the rest of it, it's it's yeah. pretty straightforward. There's... It is again because you're taking a, a biopsy in the in the nice luteal phase. It's nice, uh, you know, you've got a nice sort of thickened endometrium there. So you're you're taking it at a great time to do a biopsy. Um, so you get a good sample, and you you, you invariably do. So unless that patient has got a very thin uh, or much thinner endometrium in, in that luteal phase, 
you'll get you'll get a sample uh you really will excellent so um obviously we've uh, this is to to christine um we, we've received quite a number of these tests now into cooper do we have any idea how the distribution of calling rates uh has leveled out for the patients between pre-receptive receptive post-receptive etc do we have any kind of top level numbers that we could discuss on that? Um, well, we certainly see that most patients come back as, as receptive. Um, however, we do see, um, you know, certainly some uh, pre-receptives or post-receptives. Very rarely, actually, do we see uh, non, non-receptive. Um, it is something that, that we track pretty closely. We look to, you know, make sure we're not seeing any significant deviations there, but, um, for the, for the most part, the, the expected results really should be um, either you know, receptive, um, pre or post, and, and very rare on the, the, the non-receptive. So, I mean, obviously, Amanda's getting great results, but we do see the occasional no result. We have to be honest here to the, to the audience. Do we have any indication as to what drives those rare no results? Is there anything that we that we really need to tell people to look out for, do you think? Correct, yeah, and, and, and just to distinguish a little bit the difference between a no result um, mm. versus a result that shows a, a, you know, a non-receptive um, endometrium. Um, with regards to true no results, uh, we typically, if those, if those do come in, um, it's, it's uh, a sample quality issue is what we, we tend to see. Um, in particular, um, if the, the, the sample is quite bloody, uh, that can certainly interfere with with the with the assay. We're we're not we're not looking um, for for the uh, you know molecular profile of of blood. We're we're really you know looking at the the, the profile of the the endometrial t tissue. Uh, so that can interfere with the the assay. Um, and certainly um, you know though. It is a straightforward uh, process of the, the, the you know, sample processing and, and shipment to our laboratory. We do have instructions um, in there um, that, uh, that we you know, request that clinicians review and, and follow as strictly as, as possible, such as inverting the tube a number of times to really um, you know, mix up that sample. We, we've got, um, there, there's some, um, uh, uh, chemicals in there to preserve the, the RNA sample. That's typically what we're looking at with our assay. Um, and we do um, you know, have some stabilizers um, that are in the, the buffer we send. Um, and so if the, uh, for best results, really, if, if, uh, if those instructions could be followed pretty, pretty closely. Excellent. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, uh, it, it's worth noting also that we you know, we, we do do a visual inspection when we when we get the, the samples and we, we do tell people if we think that what the issue might be. Um, but uh, always, always talk to us about any issues. We're, we're, we're very open to, to try and help people along their path. Um, and David, if I could just also say, you know, with regards to the instruction, um, mm. more is not more. Um, with the uh, with the biopsy, we, we do very very well with that small you know almost a grain of rice size uh, um, uh, sample that that we request. We actually do get better results if um, if if the sample is kept to to around that size. Yes. So uh, the. Amanda, you've, you've spoken uh, about the kind of patients you've offered it to typically. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you see this uh, as, a, as a field that you would like to see expanded as a kind of, you'd also spoken about perhaps microbiome testing and various other endometrial testing. Yeah. Is that a, a field you think still has potential or? Yeah, I suppose, uh, um it's going to be a question of getting large numbers and data to see whether or not this is a, a test that all <laughs> women should have done. Uh, at the end of the day, it is an invasive procedure and it is probably likely that not all women do need to have it done, but it is probably, you know, really, it should be for those people with uh, recurrent implantation failure 
or, or where you do really do feel that you want to have ticked that box to make sure you've got the implantation window right to say my single euploid uh, patients. Yeah. Um, so I think it's probably not going to be for everybody necessarily, unless somebody can persuade me that that's, that's what it should be from the data. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the checking the endometrium has lots of potential benefits, for example, microbiome, natural killer cells. I mean, there are lots of, you know, lots of, there is lots of work done looking at that sort of luteal and has been for years in reproductive medicine because at the end of the day that's where you put the embryo back and that's what we'd like to have as much information about as we possibly can uh, to maximize or optimize outcome so i think there's lots of potential work surrounding uh, that endometrium and what's the what what makes the best endometrium not just the implantation window but but lots of other factors as well but, you know, as you know, and as you said, you know, getting pregnant is multifactorial, pro probably, you know, predominantly down to the embryo, uh, but uh, with importance on, on the endometrium, uh, for sure. And when it comes to the, uh, so Christine spoke about this and, uh, you know, you're, you're managing the patients day to day. And, and there's kind of been a, a question come into this line. I mean, it's all about repeatability of the measurement the transfer so when you're taking your patients through how do you control for that to make sure that the uh the time that you take the biopsy is representative mm -hmm. of when you would normally be doing an end i mean do you always do a controlled cycle do you do natural cycles i mean how, how do you control that yeah. Yeah, I mean, most I have to say most of my cycles I do, and of course, when I'm doing the receptivity uh, assay will be a medicated cycle. I mean, I have done um, uh, the assay in um, in natural cycles where in particular patients who absolutely either only can have a natural cycle, for example, uh, you know, patients who had previous breast cancer do not want to take hormone or have a medicated cycle. But most of them are, are, in fact, virtually all of them will be in medicated cycle because the, the control is there, which you don't have in the same when you're doing a, a natural cycle or a fresh cycle of, you know, stimulated um, IVF cycle. So, yeah, mostly they're medicated. So then it's easy to replicate, super easy then um, to replicate the mock cycle because we've got the mock cycle. We know the times they start the progesterone. We know the... You know we know the time we've done the biopsy so um yeah it's 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 easy to replicate when it is a medicated uh, frozen cycle sorry thank you uh i didn't mean to cough at you sorry um i think we uh, you know we, we've got a covered most of the bases here i think there's uh some subtleties around um different clinical practices that go on around the world, how we would, you know, we all do it. And I think just. To make clear, we don't prescribe exactly what that controlled cycle is. So you can set up in your clinic, as long as it is repeatable, the result will be repeatable. So we don't say you have to use drug X and progesterone levels of this and all the rest of it is is having that control and repeatability, which is what brings the success to the test. Uh, so the other thing that we, uh, we should state is we don't, uh, we don't say that you have to transfer a blastocyst either. So if you are working in a clinic and the patient only has day three embryos, be the vitrified previously, you can still transfer a day three embryo. Although we talk a lot these days about biopsying blastocyst embryos or transferring blastocyst embryos, there is nothing to state that you can't use this test with uh, an earlier stage embryo if you want. Um, so I think there's, uh, we've covered the, the questions that have come in as best that we can. It's very hard to be specific about certain patients we, we can if you'd like to email us directly we will have a, a bit more of a, a stab at some of the these questions where we've had a bit of chance to think about it and do a bit more digging but in terms of <coughs> uh, 
transfer day, whether you transfer day six embryo at day five or day six uh, or P plus six, um, presumably you would transfer, uh, you, you have a standard embryo transfer that you would prep a, late, you would prep a patient you would prep the patient expecting to do a transfer on a given day. You would take the biopsy on that day, and that's when we give the result for the transfer of the embryo, irrespective of whether the embryo made blastocyst on day five, day six, or day seven. When that embryo makes blastocyst does not change the date of when the endometrium is at its most receptive. And that's probably about as close as a guideline as we can give on this talk today, to be honest. Uh, but but do feel free free to uh, email in. Um, but we we seem to have uh, had all the questions uh, and answered them as best as we can. So I'd just like to really thank Amanda and Christine for some great information and some great talks, and all of you for attending and asking some really pertinent questions to the panel. So I will just hand over to back over to Emily to wrap up the uh, webinar. Great. Thank you, Emily. Oh, thank you so much, David. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to you as well, David, for, for q and and Amanda and Christine for, for joining us and speaking today. Amanda, it's been really great to hear your practical advice and input into how to do an endometrial biopsy. I know our audience would have really benefited from your, your presentation and answering their questions.